attributed to wartime British Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill. The quote, history is written by the victors, has become a well-renowned and famous phrase. I'm sure even when we recount our own stories, there might be parts which we seek to repress and not make as widely known lest they shape the narrative or another individual's view of us in a negative way. As we've journeyed together through the books of First and Second Samuel over the past while, I'm sure that you will have come across parts which we deliberately don't teach our children in Sunday school. It's not that we're picking and choosing which scriptures suit the narrative we're trying to push. Rather, it's just that some of it is not appropriate for children. When we teach young King David, for example, we have no problem sharing the story of his defeat of the giant Goliath. And we enjoyed it when Pastor Joanne shared the story of David and Goliath with us, didn't we? And we have no problem of him being a man after God's own heart. But if we're honest, there's one story in particular that we don't really like to talk about. And it would appear to be a strange one for us to focus on on Remembrance Sunday. However, the story of Nathan, of David rather, and Bathsheba, and King David's interaction with the prophet Nathan, which followed, is one which as we go through the book, we cannot simply gloss over because it's difficult. It's one which we must examine and one which we must look at. For this is the living words of the living God for us, his living people. And if it's in there, it seems obvious, but it's in there for a reason. A quick read of 2 Samuel chapter 11 tells the story of David and Bathsheba. David, when he should have been leading his army in battle, we're told remained home in the spring. And one night he gets up from his bed and he goes for a walk on the roof of the palace. Wouldn't it be nice to have a a palace roof to get up and walk on if you were tired? Wouldn't it be nice to have the weather that even allowed you to go outside at night time? And once he's up there, he sees a beautiful woman. Her name is Bathsheba and she's bathing. And so David likes what he sees. And he sends word to try and find out who she is. However, the news he gets back is not news that he wanted. It turns out that Bathsheba is a married woman, married to Uriah the Hittite. But even though it turns out that she's a married woman, David is not deterred. And in a deliberate abuse of his power, he sends for the woman that he might have relations with her. As with anything, there are consequences to these actions. And in the fullness of time, it turns out that these relations result in a pregnancy, which David then tries to cover up by calling her husband essentially into his office. Uriah, her husband, had been at war, where David should have been. So David, knowing that Uriah and Bathsheba could not have possibly had relations, sends for Uriah, brings him into the office and says, you have a royal pardon, go and spend time with your wife. Uriah, however, does not avail of the opportunity because there's a war going on and he's loyal to the king and country, a true patriot. And rather than this resulting in gratitude, David gets scared. David gets scared that his sin will become public. And so sends word to Joab, his general, to send Uriah to the front line where the fighting was most fierce. And as a result, lo and behold, just as David had planned it, Uriah falls in battle. We're told that Bathsheba mourns the passing of her husband. And when the time, appropriate time of mourning had passed, she was taken in by the king and became his wife. 
And as the saying goes, history is written by the victors. It appears for all intents and purposes that the king has gotten away with it. That he managed to cover the whole ordeal up. Or so it seemed. Until a man of God, Nathan, came and told him a story. And we read this story in 2 Samuel chapter 12. It says that the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe, he, ewe lamb he had brought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now, a traveller came to the rich man. But the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveller who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. This seems like a, a strange story, isn't it? Doesn't it? But, do you ever love it whenever people talk in language you can understand? Do you ever love it when people talk in stories? Us ministers are the worst for it. We often forget to talk in stories and think that everybody understands what we understand. And then we get frustrated that they don't understand what we understand because we never properly explained what we understood in the first place. So how could they possibly understand what we understand? Right? That was a lot of understanding, wasn't it? <laughs> right? But don't you love it whenever people talk plain? Don't you love it whenever people talk in ways that you can understand? Here Nathan goes before King David. Nathan, a prophet of God, and he speaks in a parable to him. In other words, he tells him a wee story. We normally associate parables with Jesus, don't we? But parables are simply earthly stories with heavenly meanings. Spoken in language that was understandable to the hearer, but always had a meaning which was deeper than that which appeared on the surface. As I said, Jesus himself spoke in parables in his days. And in his day, he often used agricultural language and images which the people would have resonated with and would have understood. But in Nathan's parable, it's, it's perhaps interesting that a ewe lamb, that's a female lamb, is used in the parable. Because David had, of course, been a shepherd in his early years. You remember before he was king, he was a shepherd. He had been a shepherd in his early years and he would have well understood the significance between that poor man and the ewe lamb. He would have understood the bond. He would have understood the love that, the, that developed between them. I know many of you have dogs and cats. I'm, I don't profess to be a dog or a cat person. I personally prefer my children and that's okay. Each to their own. But I just, I know that there is a deep bond which is built between an owner and their pet. And imagine that for a moment if you maybe have an animal yourself, one with whom you have a close bond. This is what the parable is telling us about here. Nathan had been sent to David because David's sin displeased the Lord. That shouldn't really come as too much of a surprise as we read the scriptures that what David did was not appropriate and what David did was sinful in the eyes not only of the law but the one who set the law. It was sinful in the eyes of the Lord and it displeased him. It is clear also that up until this point that David had shown no remorse for what he had done. Sure, he probably felt a little bit of guilt, but guilt and remorse are two very different things. Remorse 
causes repentance more often than not. But David's guilt caused a cover-up. A cover-up. And God, by his spirit, had no doubt been trying to speak with David and convict him of the error of his way. But have you ever talked to somebody and they weren't listening? You ever had a conversation with somebody and they're looking over your shoulder? Lord, forgive me if I've ever done that to you. <laughs> right? But have you ever had a conversation with somebody and it was very clear, Pam's going like this. <laughs> and she's clearly not talking about you, Sam. So don't worry. Right? But I'm sure we've all had those conversations where you can tell that the person has heard you but they haven't really heard you. It's gone in one ear and out the other. And God, by his spirit, has no doubt been talking to David. Had been no doubt moving in David's life and trying to convict him of his sin, pointing out the error of his ways. But David wasn't listening. And I wonder this morning if we've ever been guilty of the same. That's not something that requires a verbal answer. But I wonder this morning if we've ever been guilty of the same. Maybe God's been speaking to us. Maybe God, maybe we've done something and we've been running away from it. We've been trying to repress it. We've sorted it out so that nobody else has found out. So that nobody else knows and we think that that's enough. Maybe God has been speaking to us and we've just not been listening. God's ways are perfect. And God didn't revert to plan B because God doesn't need a plan B. But instead God, whenever David was ignoring him, God sent someone whom David trusted. Last week, we talked about the prophet Nathan, whether you realised it or not. As we looked at this promise of God in 2 Samuel chapter 7, that God would establish David's kingdom and his throne forever. That message, that hope, that promise was given through the prophet Nathan. Nathan was a bearer of good news. To David. I don't know about you, but if somebody brought me news that good, I would love it when they walked into your room. And I'd think to myself, happy days. What's next? There's going to be more. There's going to be more. There was a, a relationship of trust between Nathan and David. And God makes no mistake whenever he sends Nathan to David. Nathan was a friend, someone who had David's back. There was trust there. And sometimes, sometimes individuals are placed in our lives that we might hear that which the Lord has for us. Because sometimes we can be as spiritually deaf as a doorpost. Some of us might be as deaf as a doorpost, but spiritually, we can all be guilty at times of being as deaf as a doorpost. Or perhaps even worse. And my wife tells me I have this. We can have selective hearing. Where we hear what we want to hear. And we don't hear that which we don't. And sometimes God places individuals in our lives and sends individuals into our life when we have been exercising spiritual deafness or selective hearing. That we might hear from the mouth of someone else what the Lord has for us. And God, this tells us this, that God continues to speak to David and therefore with him being the same yesterday, today and forever, does the same for us. God continues to speak to David in a variety of different ways, even whenever David's not listening. See, David thought that enough time had passed 
and that the cover-up had been successful enough that no one else would ever find out about his misdemeanor. However, as, as is the pattern of history and indeed the pattern of scripture, everything comes out in the wash. We read in Numbers 32 and 23 a phrase which my father said to me many times in my teenage years. Be sure your sins will find you out. And this morning, if you're exercising selective spiritual hearing, maybe you need to be reminded this morning that there's no transgression, there's no sin too big that God will not forgive a truly repentant heart. But maybe we may also need to remember that a heart that remains unrepentant and tries to bury and refuses to address sin begins to build a barrier between a holy God and an unrepentant son or an unrepentant daughter. On the one hand, there's no sin too big that God will not forgive a truly repentant heart. But on the other hand, if we try and cover it up, if we try and bury it and we try and keep it secret and we do not repent of it, a barrier is built between a holy God and an unrepentant son or daughter. What are we carrying? And I deliberately don't say you because the Lord speaks to me as well. What are you and me? What are we carrying round with us this morning that we need to lay at the feet of Jesus? What are we carrying this morning that we need to put down? What are we carrying this morning or covering up or burying deep down that we just need to come before a gracious God and repent of? 1 John 1 and verse 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Burying sins not repented of leads to spiritual wilderness and loss of intimacy with Creator God. And whilst confession and repentance can be painful, these are used to form us more and more into the people of God which we have called, we, which we have been called to be. Imitators of Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We see the parable which was told. And next we see the pronouncement. We're told that David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. It's very emphatic, isn't it? There's not much wiggle room there. Then we're told that he must pay for that lamb four times over, which we're told in the book of Exodus is the payment which must be paid. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Nathan, a trusted friend, has come and he's spoken a parable to his friend, King David. But what happens here is this. David takes this parable literally. He takes the parable literally. You see, David, as the king, he would have been used to to people coming to him with judicial matters. The king was the justice system. The king was the justice system and so whenever somebody came with a story like that, David's automatic presumption was that he needed to cast some form of judgment. And his judgment is emphatic. His judgment is clear. This man must die. There's no wiggle room, as we said. And my kid find that hilariously funny. <laughs> But David, when this is brought before him, he clearly and quickly identifies that there is one man who is in the wrong, 
and another who has been wrong. And he makes a judgment very quickly. A judgment which far exceeded the crime which had been committed. Because the crime here was theft. And theft was not a capital punishment. Theft was not a crime, even in those days, that was punishable by death. But that was David's pronouncement. That's what he pronounced over him. If we park that for a moment, I want to ask you another question. Have you ever met someone or been that someone who has had a guilty conscience but are unwilling to admit that they or you are guilty? Have you ever, you ever met somebody like that? It's sometimes easier to answer that question than the other one, isn't it? Right? Have you ever met somebody like that? Have you ever been that person? It's incredibly infuriating. It's frustrating, but it's more than that. It's infuriating. It makes your blood boil a little bit, if you're honest, doesn't it? Particularly in my teenage years, whenever I knew I had done something I shouldn't have, I find that instead of sorting it out, one of the things I would do would, become, would be become the first person to condemn someone else, someone else for doing exactly the same thing. I reckon that if people saw me speaking out about something that I, I would have never possibly have done that myself. They would have never possibly thought of it. I remember my dad coming to me, and I know I talk about my dad and my relationship as a teenager a lot, but I remember my dad coming to me about something, and he just said, he looked me in the eye, and he says, thou doth protest too much. In other words, I'm on to you. What have you done? Let's sit down, and let's talk about it. See, they say that you should walk a mile in somebody's shoes before you cast judgment don't they? But the reality is that many people already have walked a mile in that person's shoes. And in an attempt to quash their own guilty conscience, they double down on judgment and condemnation rather than choosing the high road of grace and mercy. If someone's condemning you, the odds are that they've got a guilty conscience of their own. That they've got something unresolved in their own lives that needs sorted out. After all, if God can forgive the unforgivable in us, surely we should be a people who extend similar grace and love to those around us who are truly sorry and repentant for what they have done. Every time I think of these lines, I think of John McClellan, Audrey's late husband. Because he'd fist pump at this part. <laughs> says in that great hymn, it says, No condemnation, now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. When we have no condemnation against us, it's very difficult to condemn somebody else. And whilst David pronounces death upon this hypothetical rich man, David also speaks to the human condition. Just as Paul did in Ephesians chapter 2. Where in verses 3 to 5 he says, All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Where David declares death over the rich man, God through Nathan, hits him square between the eyes, just as David had Goliath the giant. For we read the prognosis. Then Nathan said to David, <laughs> You are the man. You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. 
I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Alexander McLaren, who was a great preacher of old, once said that God accuses us and condemns us one by one that he may save us one by one. David's sin could not be confessed in a general sense. It needed to be specifically called out and specifically repented of before the Lord. Because the reality is that there is a big difference between generally saying sorry to someone and actually saying what you're sorry for. Just in the same way that there is a big difference between saying, I love you, and saying, I love you because. There's a big difference between saying, I have sinned, and actually naming that sin before the Lord and confessing it to a trusted confidant or accountability partner. You see, we must not forget, whenever we look at this passage, that God had established for David a kingdom. He had delivered him. He had given him. He had made him ruler over the nation. And yet, in David's humanness, whether he said it this way or not, it still wasn't enough for him. It still wasn't enough. You can almost hear the strain in God's voice, can't you? You can almost hear the strain in God's voice whenever he says, if all this had been too little, I would have given you more. If all this had been too little, I would have given you more. David's actions, his sinful actions, they were forgivable. And they were forgivable because of the graciousness of God. But the cover-up, the lies, and the lack of gratitude towards a faithful God stood in the way of David's forgiveness. And that begs the question for us. And I know this morning we've been jumping here and we've been jumping there and there's been lots of questions and there's been lots of internalising of answers. But I wonder this morning... What is standing in the way, and in this case I will say you, because it's personal. What is standing in the way of you experiencing the fullness of the blessing that God has for you? Is it pride? Is it ego? Is it an unrepentant heart? Is it embarrassment? Is it shame? Is it guilt? Is it an unwillingness to let go? Is it unforgiveness? The list could go on. And only you know the answer for you. And as I was reflecting even this morning when going over this, I knew there was something I needed to sort out. And there was something that I needed to hand over Something that was standing in the way of me experiencing the fullness of the blessing which God had for me. Because for Sammy, God has a Sammy-sized blessing. And for Pam, he has a Pam-sized blessing. And for Ida, he has an Ida-sized blessing. And so on and so forth. My blessing is no greater than your blessing, but your blessing is unique to you and mine unique to me. And the one thing 
which binds it all together is the once for all sacrifice which Christ made so that we could be free. You are the man, the Lord said through Nathan. The only thing standing between you and intimacy with God is you. Jesus paid it all. He made relationship, forgiveness and intimacy possible. So what's standing in the way? And quickly, as we close this morning, you're maybe thinking, what on earth has this got to do with Remembrance Sunday? What on earth has it got to do with that one Sunday in the year which we set aside to purposefully reflect and remember the sacrifice that was made by many, that we might enjoy the freedoms that we experience in East Belfast in 2022? The interaction between Nathan and David points us to a God who does not treat us as our sins deserve. It points us to a God who is full of grace, who is full of mercy, who is abounding in steadfast love. It points us to a God who took on human flesh and dwelt among us, laying down his life that we might experience true freedom. Freedom from sin, Freedom from condemnation of sin. Life and life abundant. Not just in the life that is to come. But in the here and now. The God points us to the God who laid down his life. And paid the debt of sin that was on our heads. That we might glorify him. And enjoy him forever. And walking in the freedom that he brings through the forgiveness of sins which is available to each one of us when we come in true repentance. Today we live in freedom. But today the scriptures tell us that we can experience true freedom. True freedom which comes through repentance. Which comes through reliance upon a faithful God. Without him, we are eternally lost, destined for eternity, separated from him. But in him, the way, the truth, and the life, the one through whom we have access to the Father, through him and through repentance, we have forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. So this morning, God says, don't be like David. Rather, get out of your own way. Get out of your own way and come to him. Come to him, for he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Let's stand as we sing in response and as the children join us again.